In this video, we're going to define crystal field stabilization energy and use this to try to rationalize some physical properties of molecules. In a previous video, we defined a spectrochemical series. This is a series in which we consider either the ligand or the metal center's influence on the splitting between the energy levels in the D set. So for example, delta O in an octahedral compound, the splitting between the T2G and the EG set. In this video, we're gonna further develop this concept and employ it towards understanding the stability of a transition metal complex. So let's consider this reaction here, this water exchange reaction. We have an aqua metal ion complex, so a transition metal center surrounded by six water molecules, and we're looking at the exchange of one water molecule for another. And we can determine a rate constant for this, so a K of exchange. If we do this for transition metal ions, what we find is that this exchange rate constant covers over 20 orders of magnitude. So rate constants that are very fast to rate constants that are very slow. Broadly, we can characterize rate constants that are very slow as ones in which you would have a compound that we would call inert, meaning that it's relatively stable. We're not gonna see any type of ligand exchange from this. Those which have fast rate constants, we call those metal compounds labile, in which you'll have rapid ligand exchange. As an arbitrary dividing line, for our purposes, we're going to call labile compounds those compounds that have rate constants, constants greater than 1, and those that are inert that have rate constants less than 1. What we want to do is we want to try to get some insight into why transition metal compounds display these widely different rate constants when we look at water exchange. And to do this, we're going to use a concept called a crystal field stabilization energy to try to rationalize why some compounds are inert and other compounds are labile. And something that I need to point out is that there's a large number of factors that go into why these compounds display these different rate constants. The argument that we're going to present is just one facet, and it's purely a thermodynamic argument. We're looking at stability of a compound relative to an intermediate species that's going to be generated. So first, let's go through and define what we mean by a crystal field stabilization energy. A crystal field stabilization energy is the amount of stability, the stability of a complex, relative to its free ion and the stability is going to be imparted by being embedded in a crystal field. And to understand this, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a formal cobalt 2 plus ion, so a 3D7 ion, that's contained in a strong OH field. So in a strong octahedral field, that free ion, the five degenerate 3D orbitals are going to split into our T2G and our EG sets. Because it's a strong field, six of those electrons are going to fill the T2G orbitals, and then we're going to have one electron promoted up into the EG set. We can now go through and assign energies of these orbitals relative to the free ion, so the ion where we have no field surrounding it, where we have those five degenerate D orbitals. The T2G orbitals are stabilized by a value of 4 dq, and the EG orbitals are destabilized by a value of 6 dq. That means that what we're going to do is we're going to assign an energy to each of those electrons described by a T2G orbital of minus 4 dq, and an energy of every electron assigned to the EG orbitals of plus 6 dq. In addition to those energies, we also have an additional energy term that we have to consider, the pairing energy. So every time we place two, orbit, two electrons in the same orbital, we're going to have pairing energy associated with that. So if we look at the free ion, it has an energy that's going to be equal to two times the pairing energy, two times the energy that it takes to bring two electrons together in the same orbital. In the case of the octahedral field, the energy provided by the crystal field is going to equal 6 times negative 4 dq for those 6 electrons in the T2g orbitals, plus 1 times 6 dq for the 1 electron in the EG orbitals, 
plus three times the pairing energy because we brought six electrons and paired them together into those three different orbitals. So we have three pairing energies that we have to encounter. What this sums together is negative 18 dq plus three times the pairing energy. The crystal field stabilization energy would be the energy provided by the crystal field minus the energy of the free ion. So in this case, this would be equal to minus 18 dq plus one pairing energy because two pairing energies of the free ion are going to cancel out one of the pairing energies of the octahedral field. So that's our crystal field stabilization energy for the cobalt 2 plus ion in a strong octahedral field in terms of energies given in values of dq and pairing energies. If we wanted a quantitative value for the crystal field stabilization energy, then we could look up what appropriate values for dq and the pairing energy would be for a cobalt 2 plus ion in this particular ligand field. To see how this applies to our water exchange reaction, we can consider a six coordinate metal center that's undergoing water exchange. So six waters and one of those is going to exchange out. And we're going to look at two different metal ions, an iron 3 plus and a cobalt 3 plus. Iron 3 plus is a 3D5 ion and cobalt 3 plus is a 3D6 ion. What we're looking at here is a labile metal center, the iron, and an inert metal center, the cobalt. We're going to employ this concept of a crystal field stabilization energy to understand why the cobalt is inert and why the iron is labile. And one piece of information that we need to know is the mechanism by which water exchange happens from this six coordinate species. Water exchange is going to bring us through a five coordinate intermediate that we're going to describe as being in D3H symmetry, so a trigonal bipyramidal species. So we're going to lose a water, go from six coordinate to five coordinate, and then pick up water, going from five coordinate to six coordinate. And the important part in this process is going from the six coordinate to the five coordinate species. If we look at the appropriate crystal field splitting diagrams and look up values for the energies relative to the barycenter, we have these particular energies going from 6 coordinate OH to 5 coordinate D3H. We can go through and calculate what the energies provided by the crystal field are using these equations here. So the energy provided by the octahedral field is going to be the number of electrons in the T2G set times negative 4 dq plus the number of electrons in the eg set times 6 dq plus the number of paired electron sets so um, two electrons paired together into one paired set for d3h it's going to be the number of electrons described by the e primes times negative 2.72 dq plus the number of electrons described by the E primes times negative 0.82 dq plus the number of electrons described by the A1 prime times 7.07 dq plus the number of electrons that are going to be in paired sets. So um, two electrons per paired set would equal one pairing energy. Another piece of information we need to know are the relative values of dq and pairing energies. In the case of iron 3 plus, we can look this up and find that the value for dq in, in a water field is going to be uh, 1,040 wave numbers. And the pairing energy, the amount of energy that it takes to place two electrons together, is close to 30,000 wave numbers. What this means is that in both the case of an OH symmetry and in the case of D3H symmetry, Iron 3 plus with water surrounding it is going to be high spin in both cases. For cobalt 3, we have values of dq for cobalt 3 interacting with water of 2700 wave numbers and pairing energies for cobalt 3 ion of close to 24,000 wave numbers. If you go through and calculate and compare pairing energies versus the stabilization that you would get by placing electrons into lower energy orbitals, what you find is that the cobalt-3 compound is going to stay low spin in both D3 
the six coordinate and the five coordinate form. So the iron three plus is gonna be high spin. The cobalt three plus is gonna be low spin. What we're now gonna do is go through and calculate what the crystal field stabilization energies will be going from six coordinate to five coordinate. This is the electron configuration that you get for our iron three plus. In the free ion case, you have five unpaired spins. So the energy related with the free ion is equal to zero wave numbers. In the case of the OH field, what you find is that the energy associated with that is also zero wave numbers. The energy gained by placing electrons in the T2G orbital is canceled out by the energy lost by placing electrons into the EG orbitals. We have no paired electrons, so it's zero. The energy that this compound has in a D3H field is also zero wave numbers. All of your stabilization gets canceled out by your destabilization, so that's also zero. So the energy provided by the crystal field in either OH or D3H symmetry is going to be zero. If we compare this to the energy of the free ion, this also means that we don't lose or gain any energy by placing this ion in a crystal field. So iron three plus does not lose energy in a crystal field environment relative to the free ion. In the case of this water exchange kinetics, what's important for us is that going from five coordinate to six coordinate or six coordinate to five coordinate, this molecule is not losing or gaining crystal field stabilization energy. There's no penalty for it becoming a five coordinate species. Therefore, from the standpoint of a thermodynamic argument, it can go through and achieve that intermediate species and then pick up another water going to that six coordinate species. If we now look at the cobalt three species, we have these particular electron configurations. In the case of the free ion, we have those six electrons. So we have two electrons that are gonna be paired. So the energy of the free ion is equal to the pairing energy. In the case of cobalt three, it's gonna be low spin in both the octahedral and the D3H case. Going through and calculating the crystal field energy in the case of an OH ligand environment, using the values that we have for cobalt-3, we come up with the energy of this cobalt-3 species in an OH field of 6,000 wave numbers. So it's destabilized. But remember, what we're interested in is not whether or not it's stable or destable, it's whether or not it's stable or destabilized relative to the free ion. And that free ion has the energy of a pairing energy, so close to 24,000 wave numbers. So there's net stability by putting in this OH field. In the case of the D3H field, what we calculate is that the energy here is gonna be 13,400 wave numbers, which is greater than in an OH field. Another way of saying this is that this cobalt-3 species is losing stabilization energy going from OH to D3H. The more positive we make that value, the less stable it is. If we go through and calculate what our crystal field stabilization energies are, in OH symmetry, the crystal field stabilization energy for the cobalt-3 species is close to 18,000 wave numbers, while in D3H symmetry, it's closer to 10,000 wave numbers. So it's losing 8,000 wave numbers of stability by going from OH to D3H. It's less stable achieving that intermediate state. So there's gonna be a thermodynamic barrier in place going from six coordinate to five coordinate because it's losing energy to do that. This is one of the reasons why iron three plus is labile and cobalt three plus is inert. It's because the iron three plus does not lose crystal field stabilization energy while the cobalt three plus loses a significant amount of ligand field crystal field stabilization energy upon going to that five coordinate species. So in summary, crystal field stabilization energy is the stability that's provided by a crystal field relative to the free ion. 
So how much more stable a species is when you embed it in a ligand environment relative to just having it as a free ion. To calculate a crystal field stabilization energy, one considers the energy of the electrons in a particular crystal field environment expressed in terms of pairing energies and dq values or some other terms are sometimes used, and then those are normalized to the free ion values. If you need to have quantitative values associated with the crystal field stabilization energy, you can use experimentally derived values for DQs, pairing energies, to estimate a quantitative value for these terms. And I should bring up that a number of different physical properties can be rationalized using crystal field stabilization energies. In this case, we tried to rationalize water exchange kinetics, but you can also rationalize the stability of a compound in one coordination geometry versus another. So why would a compound want to be in a tetrahedral coordination environment versus a square planar coordination environment, for example? Coming up next, we're going to discuss spectroscopic term symbols. However, before we get into spectroscopic term symbols, it might behoove you to look through and understand a little bit about spectroscopic selection rules.